Hi everyone, we're very excited to announce that we are launching the Scritter's Complete Guide to Learning Chinese. It is a complete guide to learning Chinese. It's expertly put together by our very own Lalinga, as well as the teachers and learners on the Scritter team. We have been learning and teaching Chinese for a very long time, and we want to make sure that you avoid all of the pitfalls that we experienced and learn what you need with the methods that suit you the most. I interview Ula on the guide where he shares many tips, concepts, and strategies that can be applied to both beginners and advanced learners of Chinese. We really hope you find the guide useful and you can download the guide on the Scritter store. Enjoy. Can you give me a short introduction, Ula? I'm Ula Linge, and I am the resident pedagogical dromedary at Scritter, which means that I work with <laughs> questions of how to learn and teach Mandarin. So, for example, I put together the contents for our character course, and uh, now I've been working on this study guide that we're going to talk about. Uh, when I don't work at Scritter, I run a website called Hacking Chinese, and I also work with professional development at university here in Sweden, and also with languages for specific purposes. Thank you very much for that introduction. So, uh, of course, this video is all about our study guide. We are so excited to share this with all of you. So maybe with we can start with this first question. Who is this guide for? And why did we make it? I mean, Scritter deals mainly with vocabulary, and vocabulary is an important part of learning any language. I mean, we need to learn thousands of words, and in the case of Chinese, also characters, to be able to really say we, we know the language. And that takes a lot of time, and that's what Scritter is mainly for. And then we do other things to support that. But I think it's important to realize that vocabulary learning is not something that happens in a vacuum. Uh, it's not the only thing you're doing, and or at least it shouldn't be. Uh, you should be listening, you should be reading, you should be speaking and writing and so on. And all this takes place in a life of some kind. You're doing other things, right? Most of us are not studying full time. And even if we are studying full time, we are different people doing different things. And so integrating your scritter practice with other things you're doing and understanding how to build an approach or a method for learning Chinese that will make you able to reach your goals with the help of scritter, but also including other things. is a question that comes up often from users. How do I do this? What is the goal here, really? To answer these types of questions, it's hard to just give a one-line answer. So that's why, why we wrote this, this guide. As much as we as scritter would like scritter to be the center of your universe, we know um, as learners and as teachers that's just uh, not really realistic. So if you are, I think right. this guide is particularly useful for beginners, but there is also a lot of value, I think, for intermediate learners and mm. above. I think we'll also get a lot of uh, value from this guide, particularly if you find that you're coming across, maybe you just don't feel like you're studying as effectively. Maybe you're questioning yourself with your methodology. I think there is a lot of interesting things in this guide. And of course, we'll talk about this later on in the interview. Very simply, I think we cover what you learn, how you learn, and how much time you should invest, which are broad topics, but we've broken mm. them down into kind of digestible chunks. Uh, like you said, I think for beginners, everything is going to be important at some point. Uh, but of course, the more yeah. you know, the the less <laughs> things will be completely new to you but you're right i think everybody will get something out of this unless you feel that you have completely figured out exactly how to learn chinese and uh, know all the ins and outs and how to integrate say vocabulary learning with the other areas of learning chinese but i think that's not true for most people so we hope that the guide will be useful for everybody so i'm kind of jumping ahead a little bit but if you are a beginner I think chapter one covers a lot of the basics. So I think that's definitely something that uh, you should check out. And of course, yeah. we're going to go through some of the contents of the later chapters uh, as we go along. Okay, yeah. Ula, um, as you know, as we all know, um, Scritter, we're very focused right now on vocabulary building, vocabulary review, practicing. So you would think that what we want our users or what we would recommend learners to do is to learn as much vocabulary as possible and to load up your scritter cues to be as comprehensive as possible. But actually, it sounds counterintuitive. That's not actually what we want you to do. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, so learning a lot of words is useful. And I think everybody knows that having a broad vocabulary in the language will allow you to do things. I mean, when you read and listen, for example, if you don't know the words, it will be very hard. If you know everything else, you can sometimes guess anyway, but not knowing words is a major thing when you want to read and listen to something in Chinese. And then, of course, when you speak and write yourself, you also need words. Uh, and if we compare with something like grammar, 
I would say that words is, are indeed very important and, and the quantity here matters quite a lot. I mean, if you have the grammar, uh, but not the words, you can't really say anything. But if you have words, but just rudimentary grammar, you can still say quite a lot. So I would say that vocabulary is important and that growing your vocabulary is an important goal for most learners. But of course, this is a measurable thing. It's easy to say, okay, I get to this number and I will be able to do something in Chinese. And that is not the case. There are so many other things we want to do. It's not just about size either so it's also about which words you learn yes um, and particularly I would say this is important for beginners and maybe lower intermediate learners because before you have the basic vocabulary down and the basic vocabulary here means the kind of words you need to use regardless of what topic you're talking about later if you want to say yeah you want to talk about business in Chinese or you want to go to I don't know, a science fair or something and, and deal with that. Then you can expand with that vocabulary later. But the basic vocabulary that you need to talk about anything, that is really, really important. And before you've learned those words, uh, learning other words kind of takes away from, from that effort. We have a limited capacity to learn things, if nothing else, because we have a limited amount of time and we can't spend all our time learning Chinese. And so focusing on the most important words first is well, important. It's a little bit difficult to identify what words to learn first. And this is something that students ask uh, a lot as well. Like, should I learn this or that? Should I study this list or that list? Or should I focus on this area or that area? I think there are basically two ways of thinking about it. So one way is to say that the most common words are the most important to learn. And that to a large extent is true. And it's especially true that the more advanced you get. So for example, if you're an intermediate learner and you, you figure out that, okay, there are these high frequency words that I don't know, then maybe mm -hmm. you should learn them. As a beginner, that's not really true because there are many words that are extremely common in the language, especially in the written language, that you don't really need as a beginner. And yes. then you might be better at learning other types of words. So, for example, things that are particularly useful if you visit China or if you're a beginner student of Chinese. Uh, so words like English, for example, or so so for toilet is very yes. good to know, but they are not <laughs> super high frequency compared to yeah. other words. So this is what we talk about in, in chapter two where we talk about what to focus on and the importance of doing that. Yes, so finding the right vocabulary at the place where you are in your study journey. So how to select and yeah. how to focus and hone down. And I would say sometimes, particularly for beginners, it's even taking a step back, looking at, for example, components of characters, looking at the building uh, blocks of Chinese characters. It may sure. feel like at the beginning you're is it worth kind of investing this time? Shouldn't I just go and like go ahead and launch myself into maybe, you know, uh, uh, let's, I mean, of course, something like HSK1 is always going to be useful to you. Mm -hmm. But I think sometimes taking a step back and, and focusing on those building blocks will actually pay dividends uh, later on down the line. And that's also something that we, uh, we cover in chapter two. And these questions are not very simple because <laughs> if you go, let's say you want to learn all the building blocks of every single character you learn, it will take a long time to get started and get anywhere at all and be able to do or say things in Chinese. And this is not what we recommend, but this is exactly the type of question that we discuss in this chapter to figure out, okay, you should learn building blocks, but which building blocks? Yes. And what criteria do you use to decide what to learn and so on? And this is not very complicated. It's just that if you haven't been through it yourself, it's a little bit hard to judge what is useful full and what is worth investing time on. Whereas if you have been through it as uh, we have, uh, then it's easy to know so we can hopefully guide you to make it easier for you. Okay, so now we've talked about what you should study. Um, in chapter three, we talk about how uh, you should study. And of course, studying effectively is something that is a passion of ours here at Scritter. Otherwise, there wouldn't be the Scritter app, right? We would all be just kind of writing out endless amounts of study cards. Can you tell us a little bit more about how we can study more effectively and what are the things that we cover in the guide? The question of how to learn is, of course, an important one. I'd like to start by saying that there is no one solution to this problem. And there will be other people or services that claim that there is one golden path that is the best way to do it. And that's just wrong. Uh, there might be one specific path for you that happens to be the best for you, but it's extremely unlikely that that is exactly the same as somebody else's. And it's also uh, exceedingly unlikely that it happens to be uh, the same as a commercially available product. And this is why this chapter is called designing your own method for learning Chinese. So designing here refers to the fact that you have to, to make decisions yourself based on who you are, 
what you want to learn Chinese for, what you like, what you prefer, where you are, and things like that. And that means that you have to make decisions yourself, and we will take you through this process, discuss what matters, why it matters, so that you then can, well, design a method for yourself. It might sound scary to design your own method, but it's basically just picking between various good options depending on well, what situation you're in and what you're learning Chinese for. I found this chapter particularly useful. It's funny because I feel like a lot of the topics we cover are kind of common sense topics, right? And then of course, a lot of it's built on the experience of us as learners and us as teachers. But I found this particularly useful now that I'm kind of revisiting Japanese. And I do feel that like, sometimes when you start learning a language, like I, I, I found this in myself, that I was getting like very greedy with what I wanted to do. And then I kind of bit off more than I can chew. And kind of going back to kind of thinking about, right, okay, I have limited time now. How, mm. what do I want to study? How do I want to study? And particularly on the how, um, really uh, helped me kind of actually, again, improve my daily practice and gave me a bit more clarity. And again, so this might be a good example then that this is this chapter specifically, I think, is useful for everybody, not just beginners. Uh, we have lots of users, and I meet students too, who maybe make the same mistake you just said here about Japanese. <laughs> uh, you know, I want to learn much, yeah, yeah, or just adding too many words. I mean, in the scripter yeah. context, maybe studying too much vocabulary. And like you said before, we want, I mean, obviously we build scripter because we think it's very useful, uh, but it isn't the end all of learning Chinese. And there, there are other things you should be doing and, and paying attention to how to learn here makes quite a big difference. I definitely reflected on that again, after, uh, after going through the guide and, and using it to guide my own learning. I definitely, yeah, I was, I was like adding endless amounts of menus because I'm about to um, visit Japan. Yeah. And then I was watching all these TV shows and I was just adding and I had to kind of go back and kind of like calm down. You know, you just need to ban the words for now. You'll mm. get to that later. You know, I was like adding menu items, but then I couldn't even like describe the weather. You know, I couldn't even get through like basic talk, like basic patter. Um, yeah. So yeah, it's it's good to kind of go back and 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 check yourself. And sure, th that's one of the things that we do talk about in this chapter. Of course, the importance of not trying to build to a some kind of advanced level too quickly. Yes. I usually, I usually I don't know, but sometimes at least use this house of cards analogy. So you can build very high, but there's lots of air in your structure and that is not good. It might look cool and you might be able to say, get to book five in your textbook series and be able to read the text. But that is just because they have chosen vocabulary that's perfectly suited to you. And like I said, there's lots of air. And what you're actually better off doing if you want to communicate in Chinese is to make sure you have those lower levels, the foundation, yes. very solidly down before you do that. And I'm not saying you should only do that by, I mean, if you're interested in something or if you really need some more important or sorry, more advanced vocabulary at some point, that is fine. But I'm saying don't just aim for height. Uh, do make sure you have the foundation down. Speaking of foundation, um, I kind of alluded to this uh, earlier. So we've talked about what you need to study. Uh, we've talked about how you can study or how the guide or the topics that we cover in the guide. This is all kind of useless. You can have all the theory, all the words lined up, but if you don't actually find the time to actually learn, and again, this is one of my pain points um, right now, and yeah. it took me some readjusting to figure out. In the next chapter, in chapter four, we cover a lot about, I feel like, the psychology of learning how to build habits, and again, how to build habits that work for you. For those that might be interested in the guide, can you tell us a little bit about some of maybe the methodology that you talk about or the psychology um, that we, we cover as well? I mean, this is a problem, I think, for most people. We, we can't just program ourselves to do something. So yeah, okay, I want to become fluent in Chinese and have lots of time. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to study eight hours a day and then you just do that for, say, five years and now you're done. Uh, <laughs> that's rarely how it works. And of course, when you first start learning Chinese, that might be how it actually works. You don't yeah. maybe need to force yourself to do things. And I'm not talking about forcing yourself to do things here. Uh, you don't need to find or to actively manage your motivation because you are so enthusiastic about learning Chinese that you'll do everything anyway. And that is great. So if you're still in that phase, just surf the that wave <laughs> as far as you can. Yeah. But it is going to... Uh, ebb at some point. You, you can't keep doing that forever, or most people can't. So when you reach maybe an intermediate level, you find that, okay, it's not that easy to just do all the things I think I ought to do. 
even if they are interesting and sometimes even fun, it's hard to convince yourself to do these things. So that's about motivation, why you are doing things and uh, what, why this matters. And like you said, doesn't really help. Even if you have the perfect method, we tell you that, okay, this is exactly how you do it, which we don't do, by the way, as I yeah. said, you design your own method. But assuming that you have designed your own method, I know this is the perfect method for me. And uh, I know exactly what I want to learn. But then you end up scrolling on Instagram or watching YouTube instead, mm -hmm. not in Chinese then, but in, in yeah. your native language. Uh, you won't, it doesn't matter that you have all these things uh, nailed down. So uh, figuring out how to invest more time is quite important. And I would say there are three basic approaches that we talk about in the guide. And so the first one is what I call the managerial approach. So that's for the CEOs and the business owners out there. Uh, it's for the people who like check boxes and diagrams and stuff like that. And you basically deal with learning Chinese as any long-term project. You break, you have a long-term goal, you break it down into say, medium-term goals, short-term goals, you do time boxing, you do all these kinds of uh, tracking your progress to see how you, you gradually improve, how you're able to invest time and so on. And that works for some people, but not everybody. I think some people get a bit sick when you tell people you have to break this goal down into 10 smaller ones and write them down and all this yeah. kind of too much. You don't want to do it. So another way that I think is very helpful thinking about how to invest more time is what I call the forking path. So essentially think of yourself walking down a path and then there is a fork in the path. You can go left or you can go right. Depending on where you go, you will end up further to the right or left, obviously. And if you make lots of these decisions and you walk generally towards the horizon, if you always pick right, you will obviously end up further right uh, when you get to the horizon. Or uh, if you choose left, you will go uh, further to the left. Or if you should take some combination, you will end up in the middle. So right here uh, might be defined then as Chinese or alternatives that include Chinese. And on the left, we have other languages or say English, if you're a native speaker of English. So what this approach basically says is that each time you have one of these choices, strive to choose Chinese and strive to make this choice as easy as possible. Concrete example, let's say you're, okay, you want to listen to a podcast or you're going to listen to something uh, while you are doing the dishes. And then you, okay, you can choose Chinese or you can choose English. So this is a small choice that you make maybe hundreds of times per day, most of the time, or increasing the number of times you choose to go to the right, to the Chinese side, the further to the right you will end up on the horizon, which means that you are using more Chinese. And this doesn't require any kind of management. It's just a moment-to-moment -moment decision. I choose to do this because it includes Chinese over this other thing. And you don't need to do that all the time. It's just that you do it more and more, or at least you strive towards doing that. Just quickly on this method, um, this is something that again um, going through the study guide has given me reflection on my personality or maybe just how I was trained to work I was definitely more in the managerial camp right okay I'm gonna sign up for this exam and you know th this is how I'm gonna do it this is the textbook I'm gonna do but in fact um, I've realized in this particular state uh, just in case um you guys that are watching maybe are not uh, quite I haven't been um, explicit uh, I've had a baby um, this last year my daughter is now one so obviously personal time is very very compact and limited and I've had to kind of adjust my study. And frankly, to be fair, I think when I said I wanted to start Japanese, probably a year, half a year ago, I was making no progress until recently. And I think this forking path method is something that I've been trying to apply. Like even last night when I was turning on my Netflix, I started watching a Korean show and I was like, why am I watching a Korean show? There's plenty of other um, Japanese shows that I can mm -hmm. be watching. Sure. Um, so just those tiny little choices. Or again, when, you know, when I'm just about to scroll Reddit, I'm like, I'm just gonna learn a few words on Scritter. And I know, I like, I work for Scritter. I get it. I, I get the struggles of learning a language as a working adult with lots of commitments, you know, left, right, mm. and center. So I've had to adjust my learning method and I found this forking path method much more useful um, to me recently. So that's a bit of feedback yeah. um, on the guide. And also, I think, like you said, it's about being aware of these things. It's not like a miracle method or anything, but just simply being aware that you're making these choices all the time and by at least some of the time making a choice that aligns with your goals for learning Chinese 
will help quite a lot, especially in the long run. Okay, so the third method then that uh, you can use, which isn't really a method, it's what I said about uh, being enthusiastic as a beginner. If you can maintain that enthusiasm, maybe by focusing on things that you really like, for example, mm -hmm. let's say you really like uh, historical Chinese dramas or something, uh, that can certainly power your learning quite a lot. And maybe it's not the only thing you should do, but uh, these methods are not mutually exclusive. You can do all three at once. So these are just some things we talk about in the chapter. So the goal is to uh, motivate you to spend more time. All right, so we've shared different methods of how you can kind of approach perhaps your time allocation, but I still think it's very important to cover the habits piece. So how do we, so again, it's still kind of an approach. Now we have this approach. How do we really build these language learning habits into our day-to-day -day life? Habits are very useful. If you think of it, a uh, habit is something that uh, a behavior or a routine of some kind that you've done many times. And because you have done it many times, it doesn't require as much effort. And there's a great analogy with this that I think was first used by Kurzgesagt on, in a YouTube video, and we can maybe link to it. But basically, it's like being in a jungle. So you are in your camp and you want to go to the river to get water. And the first time you get there, it's really hard because it's a jungle, right? You have to use a machete and you have to kind of cut your way through <laughs> undergrowth. Then after like sweating buckets, you get to the river and you fill your bucket and you go back. And you sweated more than you actually got from the, fill the, the buckets you used to get fetch the water. And that's what it feels like in the beginning when you do something. It's not easy, right? But the thing is the more you do this, the more kind of you build up this path to the river, and the, when you've done it a few times, there is a path there. You don't have to use a machete anymore. You still have to go there, though. And the more you do this, the better you can make this path. Maybe you can pave it after a while, so you get it really easy. But the point is that when you do things over and over, they become easier and easier, and they require less and less effort. And while there are problems with like an approach to motivation that says that you know you have a limited amount of effort to spend per day that's not really the case but i think it's still worthwhile to think of it like that you can't really try to say change too many things at once because each of them requires a lot of energy and then it goes without saying then if you try to say build 10 separate habits at uh, at once that will require an awful lot of energy because they are all in this initial stage but if you gradually build up habits or say learning Chinese vocabulary. Uh, it means that once these habits are down, you can do these things. And sure, they still take time, but they don't take much effort. You don't need to decide. For example, brushing your teeth. It's not a decision you spend time on every day. Uh, there are lots of things that you do without needing to spend any energy deciding if you're going to do it or not. You still do it, and that's great. And that's where you want to end up with, well, say something like using Scritter, right? So if you have the habit of using Scritter for five minutes in bed before you get out of bed in the morning, or maybe every time on your commute, or every time you're in a supermarket and there's a queue, you pick up your phone and you do five minutes of reviewing. If you build up, say, five of these habits over time, you can maybe get most of your reviews in Scritter done without allocating specific time. You, you don't schedule, you know, okay, I'm going to do an hour of Scritter between eight and nine. That's not a really, a really good way of doing it. Well, it could be sometimes if you want to learn something specific, such as, say, go through our character course or yeah. look up things you've been meaning to look up. But in general, you should try to establish these habits that allow you to get your queue cleared uh, during the day while doing other things. So this is just one example of why habits are powerful. And you can do the same thing for reading, for listening and other things. But of course, since we're talking about vocabulary learning here, I think uh, that's a good example of using Scritter. Uh, in these specific, well, specific locations, specific times, and so on. That's something, that metaphor, that um, uh, visualization is something that I've been using. I'm just like, it's okay, you just, it just the, the forest is more thick this time round <laughs> when your brain is less clear, um, sure. but you're eventually going to um, get there. And that's always what we do hope for that. Like, And again, actually, that's what we hear from a lot of um, long-time scripture users, that it just becomes part of your day. And of course, that's our wish for you. But of course, this can apply to any other learning habits. It doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be Scritter. Mm, yeah. So now, this chapter is largely then about how do you do this? Uh, yes. We've talked about that you want to do it, but how do you do it? It's uh, as it was all the other things here, you can figure this out on your own or you can, well, uh, let us guide you. We've done this many times before. 
That's right. Okay, so we've talked about what to learn, how to learn, how to really build the habits for learning, how to really find uh, motivation, intrinsic uh, motivation or different approaches to learning for you. What I really like about this guide, again, versus maybe more traditional learning resources, is that uh, I know you kind of mentioned that scripture doesn't exist in a vacuum, but language learning doesn't, you know, we live in the digital age, you know, sometimes it's all well and good. And again, I went through this with Japanese where I was like trying to suddenly type something and then I was like, okay, I actually need to learn how to type in Japanese and how, you know, how, how do I make all these symbols appear? So um, I think this is um, a very useful chapter, particularly for um, beginners, but we also cover some topics like AI. Can you tell us a little bit more about chapter five specifically learning in the digital age. And, and like you said, this is something that everybody faces when they first start learning Chinese. Uh, it's a little bit better these days. I mean, I remember when I started learning Chinese and you, I, I accidentally ended up using a Japanese font. And I didn't <laughs> realize that I did that. And, and that meant that I got some things on my exams wrong because I'd learned the Japanese version of the character. And I, and I didn't realize that was a problem yeah. until uh, like after a while. Uh, that kind of problem, I think, is less common these days. But there are still a lot of questions that students have when you start learning Chinese. And most students learn Chinese digitally in some way. Even if you are enrolled in a course, I mean, locally, uh, you still do some of your learning online. Maybe you use Scritter, for example, and Scritter is certainly digital. And there are lots of other digital resources. And th this, in general, is, of course, a huge revolution in how we learn Chinese. Learning Chinese before uh, the computers and before the internet in particular uh, was completely different and, uh, I would say, an order of magnitude harder than it is these days. Doesn't mean it's easy now, but it means it was harder back then. So I would say there are two different areas that are tricky. And one of them is displaying characters. And that was kind of what I was talking about before with the Japanese font. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is about, okay, what, how should you display Chinese characters? And we, yeah, sure, your phone or your computer will mostly get it right by default, but there are some subtleties that might be good to be aware of. For example, that there are different standards of how the same character might be displayed in say, Taiwan, mainland China, Hong Kong, Japan, Korea, even though it's exactly the same character, it's written slightly differently. And these, th these things are for advanced learners or native speakers, maybe we won't even notice them because the differences are very small. Uh, but for beginners, things like this can be confusing. And then of course, there's there are questions about which input method should you use? What's best for learning Chinese? How do I use dictionaries? Which dictionaries should I use? And many questions like that, that we also cover. So yeah, displaying and inputting characters, I would say are the things that we cover, I would say most extensively in this um, part of the guide. But we also talk about things like handwriting. And of course, Scritter is meant to teach you to write characters by hand. That's one of the things we do. And it's one of the things we do best, I think. And writing characters by hand is a great way to process them rather deeply because as we all know simply typing characters or reading them uh, will not enable you to write them by hand and we should also say that maybe you don't have to write all the characters you need know how to say or how to type by hand but learning a core set or starting out with that i think is still useful because it really means you get to know the characters in a way that you don't if you focus only on typing or only on say opinion so uh we do talk about the necessity of handwriting. And uh, like I said, depends a little bit. Practically speaking, maybe not that useful these days. Uh, it's very rare to be asked to write something in Chinese by hand. I mean, after you leave school. In school, yeah. it happens all the time, but not outside school. But that doesn't mean it's useless. It's still, uh, it can still help you to, to master vocabulary long term. But you can be a little bit more relaxed about it, I think. Depending, of course, on what your goal is for learning Chinese. Like if you want sure. to teach Chinese and stand in a classroom and write on the board, well, but if you're after like most normal people don't want to do that and, and then maybe handwriting can be uh, tuned down a little bit. Even if you're an expat and there are occasions where let's say specifically in a Taiwan context where you are asked to fill out forms, mm. um, the real life. But I, I, I think for me, definitely the value lies in the, the kind of the active retention, the active mm. learning, writing out. And again, I, I know this guide is for Chinese. Um, and again, a lot of these practical tips, I think can be applied to Japanese, but right now, as I'm True. writing through the characters in Japanese or the kanji in Japanese, it's really helping me notice the difference, which mm. I think as a kind of as a native speaker of Chinese, frankly, I glanced over. 
I didn't really kind of notice the difference. I would just kind of read and kind of move on. And sometimes that that's fine. Uh, but sometimes you you actually do want to process things a bit more deeply. And if you've learned to write a core set of characters, you also have the tools necessary to fill out a form. I mean, of yes. course, if you're going to write three characters, you can just look it up in a dictionary and just you know copy the stroke order. But if you know, say, 500 characters by hand, and if you're asked to write a few sentences in Chinese, even if you use a dictionary as an aid, that's not going to be very hard because you have a hand, you know roughly how to write by hand and you know the most important characters. But if you need to look up every single thing you write, it's not going to be very pretty. And I don't mean pretty as in beautiful here. I mean, sure. it's going to be a mess in general. But I think what you said is, is important for the guide. You can use the guide to learn Japanese and we will probably create a Japanese version yes. at some point. But I think you can use most of the advice here yeah. to learn French or Hindi or other yeah. languages too. Most of the things are actually quite universal. Okay, so we've talked a lot about the content of the guide and we hope you're super interested and we'll go download it. We really do think it's gonna help you with your learning. For those of you that are like, yep, I'm gonna go download it right after I watch this video. Are there any tips on how people can actually use this guide um, in conjunction with their learning or kind of a, a user's manual, as it were, um, to our guide? Sure. So, so it's called uh, the Scritter's Complete Guide to Learning Chinese. and Complete here is intended to mean that we cover everything, not just vocabulary learning. But that also means that the guide is rather long. It's more than 100 pages. That means that it's not really meant to be read from cover to cover. I think you obviously you can do that, and it's written in a way that makes that possible and hopefully also interesting. But you're not meant to do that. Uh, instead, we've tried to make the guide as navigable as possible. Like you said earlier, just reading chapter one is a good start because chapter one includes everything the other chapters include. It, it, it's yep. basically a summary of the of the following four chapters. So if you read chapter one, you will know what the rest of the guide is about. And you will also know if there are chapters you think are more interesting than others. Maybe you think that you know digital characters and displaying characters, OK, you know those things. Then don't read chapter five. That's fine. But you want to know more about this motivation and spending more time. Then maybe do check chapter four. So it depends on what you want to get out of the guide. And you will know that after checking chapter one. And of course, you can also just browse through the table of contents because, uh, well, it does contain hopefully helpful headings that you can that you can use to find the right parts. And you can just read the bits you're interested in. And there are also lots of you know call out boxes and things like that that you can use to find your way in the text. Uh, you do not need to uh, read all of it. Just skim and, and find things that interest you and read those. Well, thank you for those tips for using this guide. Any final thoughts that you would like to share with those that are watching this video? Well, I thought this was an uh, interesting project to work on. We do, of course, get a lot of questions that are related to Scritter, but not specifically about using Scritter. And we answer these questions all the time. And then it makes sense to kind of collect all that advice and put it into one, one guide. Because as we've said many times, uh, vocabulary learning is important, but it doesn't happen in a vacuum. There are lots of other things you should be doing. And you need to integrate your uh, vocabulary learning in Scritter with these other things. And it's not trivial to figure out how to do that in a good way. And we've been using Scritter and learning Chinese, some of us, for more than a decade. That's something we think uh, is valuable and want to share with the rest of us. Another thing I want to say is that this is, uh, this is a work in progress. So uh, we are more than interested in hearing what you think about the guide. If there are things maybe we should have covered that we didn't, or if something is unclear, uh, do let us know and we can update the guide. And uh, of course, the most important thing I want to say is that I hope that you find the guide <laughs> useful and that it yeah. will help you learn Chinese or maybe French or Hindi or, or Japanese. Yeah. So good luck with your study. Well, we hope you enjoyed the guide, like Ula said, but and I just quick feedback. I, I I found the guide useful ourselves, right? It was, it, it was nice to have all of these for, for someone, again, that, that was starting out uh, with language learning. It was just sometimes you do need to read through what seems like common sense advice. Once you read it, it seems very obvious, but it was very nice to have it all in one place, in the, the way that the chapters are divided. It was very nice to kind of move through the guide chapter by chapter. And like Willa said, there are exercises, which is something that I like, or check boxes that you can go through to make sure kind of really help kind of refine um, your thinking. So obviously we highly recommend it, otherwise we wouldn't have made the guide. Sure. Um, but mm. yes, let us know. And we will be recording an audiobook version for those of you that prefer to listen to this guide uh, rather than 
read it um, and we'll keep you posted um, on that as well. All right, well, thank you very much. Lin Lao Shi, Ula, thank you so much for um, walking us through this guide that you've uh, created together with the Scritter team. <laughs> thank you for tuning in and, and listening to, to this interview and I hope you uh, will enjoy uh, the guide and find it useful. All right, bye. Bye, ciao.